And welcome to Nat Chat for Wednesday, May 1st, 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who was at Globe Life Field in Arlington, Texas. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Well, the Nats will have to wait a little while longer to have a winning record. Uh, they, for this regular season, fell to 14 and 15 with a 7 1 loss at the Texas Rangers on Tuesday night in game one of a three game series. This episode of the Nats Chat podcast is brought to us by Table 2 Matt, which you can count on for all of your nutrition and personal training needs. At Table 2 Matt offers virtual and in-person nutrition services and personal training to the DMV area. You can email at table to Matt directly via table to Matt.com, or you can call 240-388-2206. And uh, that website, table to Matt.com, the word table, the number two, and M-A-T.com, table to Matt.com. Well, the good news is that Mackenzie Gore was good on Tuesday night. The bad news is that the Nats bullpen was uh, quite bad on Tuesday night. And the Nats offense uh, may have been worse. The Nats, over the final three games of the four-game sweep at the Miami Marlins, scored 30 runs. But, Mark, the Nats on Tuesday night, just one run, just three hits, just one walk. All three of the hits were singles. Two of the hits, infield singles. Uh, That was a rather feeble offensive performance. There, there was nothing going on offensively in this game, Al. I mean, nothing. And the the, the funny thing is, uh, you know, a few batters in the game, you think, oh, this could be a good night. C.J. Abrams getting on base, advancing himself, putting himself in scoring position. Luis Garcia with a really good at bat to drive him in. You're like, okay, here we go. Let's see what they've got. And then the rest of the night was one hit, and that was an infield little dribbler uh, to the mound. I mean, and, and it's not like the Rangers making spectacular plays behind John Gray, there just was very little, a lot of quick at bats, no walks, as you said, Um, you know, you give John Gray some credit. He pitched well. Maybe there's a little bit of a, you know, the Nats after that night game in Miami, I heard they got in at 3 AM to Texas. Maybe they were sleepwalking a little bit through this one, but I mean, man, there was just not much going on offensively. And I don't even know there's a whole lot to break down from them offensively from this game because there isn't much to discuss. I don't think. No, not really. Uh, Your three Nationals hits, if you are keeping score, C.J. Abrams, uh, he is an ad starting shortstop, number one batter, uh, had an infield single in that Nats one run first, a leadoff infield single on a tapper toward first base on a one-two pitch. He, on the very next pitch, stole second base, and then it was driven in uh, by Luis Garcia Jr. He in that one run first, a two-out opposite field RBI single to left field on a one-two pitch for a one nothing Nats lead. And then the only other Nationals hit the rest of the game, Trey Lipscomb, top of the fifth, a two-out opposite field infield single on a swinging bunt toward first base on an 0-2 pitch. And thus concludes the reading of your three Nationals hits on Tuesday night. So the Nats did have a good offensive series at the Marlins. This was one game. Like you said, you know, they came in very late. And it's ridiculous that on a getaway day, the Marlins had a 640 start time on Monday, but that's another conversation. Uh, but in terms of... Uh, the Nats and a guy who continues to struggle, uh, Eddie Rosario. And I know that Davey Martinez during his postgame session with you guys addressed the Eddie Rosario situation. So, you know, he's not playing every game, but he is playing at least a decent amount. Rosario on uh, Tuesday night as the Nats starting right fielder, number seven batter, 0 for 3. His OPS for the regular season now is at 299. Uh, He is really struggling something fierce. Uh, What do you make of where we're at with Eddie Rosario? Well, it's not pretty. Um, and we talked to him afterwards as well, and, and he made no excuses for it. He said this is the worst month he's ever had in the big leagues. Uh, so he he feels it. He knows it. Now, the, the silver lining, if you want to call it that, is that historically April has always been not just his worth, worst month, but by far his worst month. He's a career 206 hitter in April, 620 OPS in April. And Every other month of the uh, baseball season over his career, he doesn't have an OPS below 735. So that's 100 points worse, more than 100 points worse than any other month. So if history holds true, he's going to snap out of this and he's going to be more productive, um, you know, once he kind of gets through this first month. Now, the problem is that first month was so bad that even if he gets better, it could still be pretty bad and not be all that productive 
uh, to begin with. So I, I think there's some real concern there. Um, Davey Martinez was adamant about knowing the track record there and about saying like, look, it's too early to just give up on a guy. I know what he's done in the past. Uh, I'm not doing that yet. And, and I get it. I get why he would say that. Here's, here's the difference. We know there is help coming in the outfield. Um, and we don't, we're not even have to talk about, you know, James Wood, Dylan Cruz. I mean, Lane Thomas eventually will be back. Victor Robles could be back fairly soon. Um, there are going to be some outfield decisions that have to be made relatively soon. And it would be hard to say that Eddie Rosario deserves to stay above someone else who might be uh, in danger of losing a job like Jacob Young, for example. So I think that's where it gets tricky. They don't have to make that decision yet, but I don't know that the rope can be so long that you say, okay, Eddie, you get another month, two months to snap out of this. At some point here, they're going to have to make a, a call on their outfield. And if you, decide to keep Eddie Rosario, you may be dropping somebody else who has been far more productive. He's a guy who was signed to a minor league contract with a non-roster invitation to major league spring training. So I think we have to keep that in mind. Like there's a reason that he was signed to a minor league contract. Now uh, in Rosario's defense and to Davey's point, I mean, this is a guy who has been productive. I mean, just last regular season, 516 plate appearances. So a pretty good sample size, 21 home runs, OPS plus, of exactly 100. He was the 2021 National League Championship Series MVP. So, you know, there is something there. Uh, but like you were just saying, I mean, the leash should only be so long. I, I do always come back now to the Josh Bell lesson of 2021 of a newcomer gets off to a really bad start. And you say to yourself, what are we doing here? And then, of course, things change and they change big time with Josh Bell. I'm not saying that's going to happen with Rosario, but I think it is fair to say, hey, we're only through April, you know, give the guy a little bit more time. Uh, but this has been tough. I mean, you mentioned the career OPS in April. His OPS is at 299. It's like half of that career o April OPS, which isn't good to begin with. So that really tells you how bad things have been. Yeah, it's O for his last 25. How many guys do you see do that? And yeah, he's been hitting the ball a little bit harder, but let's not make it out like he's uh, just getting robbed on a nightly basis. Um, there has not been a whole lot there. And then on top of all that, you got defense in right field. And there was a play in this game that not an easy play by any stretch, but a play that when he didn't make it, it turned into a triple, which at the time looked like it might be really costly uh, to them when it was still a low scoring game. So if he's contributing in other ways, you kind of brush aside the offense a little bit, but when he's not contributing in other ways uh, that, that compounds it. So they're not giving up on him yet. Like we said, um, you have to give him at least a little bit of a chance to, to show that he can do what he's done his whole career. But I don't think it's an endless rope there. And I, I think part of that is because of where the franchise is today versus where it was a year, two years, three years ago, where you know you finally have some help coming and you can't keep that help uh, away from here forever. At some point, you do have to say that's a better option for us than the veteran who's struggling. Another struggling Nationals hitter is K. Bert Ruiz. Uh, he on Tuesday night as an at-starting catcher, a number five batter, went 0 for 3. Uh, Ruiz now for this regular season, OPS of 487, uh, batting average 143 on base percentage 222, slugging percentage 265. Now he's coming off the illness, which caused him to lose a lot of weight. So I don't think we should necessarily be hammering K. Bert too hard, but it has been a rough go for him so far this season. Yeah, you'd love to know what it would have been if he didn't get sick and he just played straight through. Obviously, there's there's an adjustment period there. I'm a little surprised at how much he's played since coming back from this. I know Davey loves to play Caber Ruiz five, six times a week, but you're doing that after he missed two weeks with a pretty serious illness and, like you said, uh, lost the weight. I'll be interested. Does that change here at all? Now, uh, Riley Adams, as good as he was, he's kind of cooled off as well um, and hasn't been as productive when he has gotten in there. But I do think, like, just for Kabert's, like, long-term benefit here, you got to be careful. You can't run him into the ground right now uh, when he's coming off of a serious illness like that. I think we've seen enough from him to kind of know what he is as a hitter and to think it's not going to last. Um, you just hope physically he's up to it and that he isn't worn down already from coming back from that and playing as much as he has. Well, the biggest bright spot for the Nats in this 7-1 loss at the Rangers on Tuesday night was the Nats starting pitcher, Mackenzie Gore. Uh, he allowed two runs in five innings with seven strikeouts versus one walk. He gave up 
Five hits, uh, which were a triple and four singles. He issued a hit by pitch. He over his five innings threw a good number of pitches, but also a good number of strikes. 91 pitches, 59 strikes, 32 balls. Uh, Gore in the bottom of the fourth, a lot of run on three consecutive singles to begin the inning, including an RBI single by Jonah Heim uh, through the left side of the infield to tie the game at one. And Gore in the bottom of the fifth, a lot of run. Uh, he gave up that uh, aforementioned triple, uh, a one-out opposite field triple by Marcus Semien, the deep right center field where the ball was misplayed uh, by right fielder Eddie Rosario. Although that's a tricky spot. Rosario was approaching this uh, like diagonal portion of the outfield wall at Globe Life Field. Could have made the catch, didn't make the catch. Semien ended up scoring on a one-out arm. RBI ground out by Corey Seager. Now, Gore then issued a two-out walk, followed by issuing a two-out hit by pitch, but Gore got out of the inning by only allowing the one run. So ultimately, two runs in five innings. Mackenzie Gore now in this regular season, six starts, ERA of 319, a whip of 1.35, strikeouts for nine innings of 11.03. And he's doing this with a high BABIP allowed. I brought this up recently. The batting average on balls in play allowed for Mackenzie Gore is at 392, significantly higher than that, uh, you know, widely subscribed to league average of around 300. So there's an implication there of some bad luck. So Gore could be doing even better than what he has been doing. Uh, Ideally, he lasts for longer than five innings. But, you know, as as we discussed previously, when you strike a lot of guys out, the pitch count does tend to go up. So if you're going to, praise him for the strikeouts I think you have to understand that sometimes that pitch count is going to get uh, away from you a bit but uh, a lot to like with the season that Mackenzie Gore is having but yeah big picture I mean if if you said uh, at the end of April he's gonna have an ERA in the low threes and way more strikeouts and innings pitched you of course are thrilled with that so that's been good Uh, and he's doing against some good lineups which is another thing to be excited about as well the one little nitpick here as, as we've noted is that the pitch counts do tend to get high And he's not going deeper in games. And what's interesting here, you mentioned the strikeouts. And yeah, that oftentimes is the issue. But you know what? He struck out four batters, five batters in the first three innings. And the pitch count was only 43. So it was the long innings weren't because of strikeouts. The fourth inning, there were some long at bats that that guys were fouling off pitches uh, and just battling and extending at bats. Uh, And then in the fifth, you said the walk, the hit by pitch. By the time you get through that, he's at 91 pitches. You kind of feel like he's starting to look a little bit gassed. So I don't think it's going to take that much for him, hopefully, to take that next little step and now turn these five-inning starts into six-inning starts and ultimately the six-inning starts into seven-inning starts. But take a step back and consider what we're looking at here. This is an emerging ace on this team who has done a really good job at minimizing damage this year these couple of games we would have seen in the past that turn into you know four runs in five innings or six runs in four innings that kind of thing and he has been able to avoid those kind of starts even when it hasn't been great he hasn't been totally locked in he's able to keep the damage to one or two runs and get himself out of some jams that's a huge development i think for him so it's been fun to see the progression there and it also makes you realize there's probably more to come and maybe we are ultimately talking about a guy who is able to go a little deeper in games and continue to only give up one or two runs which would be outstanding and to the point about him doing well against good lineups texas has a pretty good lineup gore did well in this game on tuesday night you go back to his previous outing uh last thursday april 25th 2-1 loss uh to the los angeles dodgers at nationals park gore in that game one run in six innings uh you go back uh prior to that 3-2 win over the Philadelphia Phillies at Nationals Park April 7th for in that game two runs five and two thirds inning six strikeouts two walks so you know yes he has faced Pittsburgh he has faced Oakland uh, but it's not always against you know the Patsies or the presumed Patsies I mean it's still early so it's hard to necessarily know who's good and who's bad uh, but Gore's get the job done against some very respectable lineup so uh, r- very encouraging to see that uh, now, the Nationals' bullpen in this game uh, was not good. The bullpen, by and large, lately has been doing a pretty good job. Tuesday night, though, not a good night uh, for the Nats' pen. Three Nats relievers combined to allow five runs in three innings. Each reliever used in this game gave up at least a run. Jordan Weems, bottom of the sixth, he allowed a run on a one-out solo homer by Josh Smith to right field on an 0-2 pitch for a 3-1 Rangers lead. Now, in fairness to Weems, the homer went just 
364 feet per the stat cast projection. So, you know, that's not a home run in a good number of ballparks, but it was a home run in this ballpark. Uh, Jacob Barnes in the bottom of the seventh allowed a run. And then came Tanner Rainey uh, in the bottom of the eighth. He allowed three runs as his struggles continue. Rainey issued a one-out walk, issued a one-out wild pitch, gave up a one-out RBI single, gave up a one-out two-run homer, and gave up a two-out single. Uh, the homer, it was a one-out full count two-run homer by the Rangers' number nine batter, Leody Tavares, for a 7-1 Rangers lead. The homer went a projected 415 feet for stat cast. Rainey in the inning threw 35 pitches, 18 strikes, 17 balls. Your updated Tanner Rainey stats for this regular season, 11 innings pitched, 12 earned runs, 21 hits allowed, 10 walks allowed, ERA a 982, whip of 282. Uh, we have been wondering if a roster move with Tanner Rainey might be coming. At this point, how is a roster move not coming? I think we're close to a point when they do have a move coming. That's Robert Garcia, who's been on the IL with the, the influenza. Um, he is throwing. He's uh, going to be facing live hitters here soon within the next few days. And they're probably a week away from him being ready to return. And when that happens, are you going to send down Jacob Barnes, who I think has been pretty good? I know he gave up a run in this one, but overall, I think he's done a nice job for you. Uh, are you going to send him down and keep Tanner Rainey, or are you going to finally make a call on this? And look, you, you keep wanting to look for something, some glimmer from Tanner Rainey that makes you say, okay, he he's showing signs that he can be the guy he was pre-Tommy John. It's just not there. The velocity is down. The command is off. He's both getting hit hard as you've mentioned, and also walking guys and throwing pitches to the backstop for wild pitches. So it, if, if it was just a command issue, you'd say, okay, but we're talking about poor velocity, poor command, and giving up hits, like hard hits on top of all that. And there's just not a whole lot to cling to right now. Now, the issue is he's out of options. So you can't just send him down to the minors without exposing him to waivers. Is anybody else going to claim him at this point? Maybe not given what he's going through. And so maybe you just take that chance and say, anyone else, go ahead. If you want to claim him, if not, we can outright him, take him off the 40 man roster and send him to AAA to try to get him right. Maybe there is a physical ailment they can come up with or that he is dealing with to give him some more time. But it is clear a month into this uh, that he is just not the pitcher that he used to be. It's sad. It's unfortunate, but we always have to remind ourselves, not everybody comes back from Tommy John hundred percent. Uh, they don't always throw as hard or harder. In this case, he's throwing significantly uh, less and really not having results at all. And it's a problem. And I don't know that you can continue with this a whole lot longer. You mentioned, though, it may be being a week until Garcia is ready to come back. I don't know that you can wait a week with this rainy situation. I don't know how you can feel comfortable putting him back out there in a game, in any kind of game for another week here. Uh, and look, it's not fair to him. Like he's struggling. He's ailing right now. Uh, I don't think it's doing him any good to keep putting him out there and to see him keep struggling like this. To your point about the injured list, I would think, especially with him coming off Tommy John surgery, albeit a few years ago now, you could say, you know, elbow soreness or something. I, I, I mean, I, that, that doesn't seem that far fetched, uh, but I, I don't know how you go another week with him on the major league active roster. Yeah, I get it. And and maybe Garcia might be ready a little sooner than that. Maybe they do feel the need to do something here um, prior to that. They have an off day next on Monday. So you've still got two games here and then three um, with the Blue Jays over the weekend. Maybe they can get by just stashing him away and, and not using him unless it's a blowout. But maybe, uh, you, you know, it, it may depend more on what else happens. If you have a, a short start by somebody, if you have an extra inning game, if you have uh, you know, games where you're burning up your bullpen and you get to the next day and say, man, we need a fresh arm, uh, then maybe you are forced to do that move. Um, my guess is they would ideally like to wait until Garcia is ready, but if they can't, um, they may have to make that move. And as we've seen many times in recent years, when the Nats DFA someone, more often than not, he does clear waivers. We just went through this with Jake Alou. He cleared waivers. He's still with the organization. So the idea that if you DFA Rainey, he's gone, probably not. Hopefully not. If the guy has talent. Uh, it, it's tough to watch, but uh, it ain't happening right now.
Uh, Davey, in his postgame session with you guys, did get asked for an assessment of the Nats uh, now that we are through April. So the record is at 14 and 15. How would you sort of summarize uh, where the Nats are a, a full month and change, anyway, uh, into this uh, regular season? So I know it's disappointing they didn't just get one more win and be 15 and 14. We talked about what that would have meant. First winning April under Davey. Uh, first time with a winning record at all since July of 2021. But I don't think 14, 15, 15, and 14, it makes that much difference. I think there's still a lot to like about what they've done. If you said going into the season, hey, they're going to play one game under 500 in their first month of the year, you're going to see Mackenzie Gore pitch like an ace. You're going to see C.J. Abrams play like a superstar. And by the way, you're also going to hover right around 500 in spite of injuries to Lane Thomas, Josiah Gray, Victor Robles uh, and and others. I mean, I think you'd have to be pretty satisfied with that as well. So I think bigger picture, it's okay to be encouraged by this. I also think it's okay to say they should have a few more wins. The bullpen blew a couple of games. You have a couple of games here where the lineup did nothing and just a one hit here or there could have flipped the game in their favor. So I think that's okay to, to feel a little disappointed by that as well. And so, if you say 14 and 15, like I think they played a legitimate 14 and 15. I don't think they were lucky to get to that record, but I also think they could be better. If they clean up a few things here and there. And so if the whole idea of this season is that they should progressively get better, both with development of who they have here and the uh, additions that we hope are coming along the way, if 14 and 15 represents one of their worst months this year, boy, it's going to be a great season. For them so i think there's a whole lot to be encouraged by the way this went yeah i mean 14 and 15 matches up more or less with the run differential of minus 11 uh they're doing what they're doing like you said with josiah gray having been out for a while and you've had these encouraging developments this blossoming of cj abrams this unexpected rise of mitchell parker uh this continued ascension uh it seems of jake Irvin, mackenzie gore are still pitching well so th there, there are a lot of like granular things that you can attach yourself to like you know, when it comes to somebody like Eddie Rosario struggling or Joey Gallo struggling, yeah, but in the big picture, does that really matter? Not all that much. Th these other things are what matter, and these other things are good. Like, these other things are, like, big picture good. Uh, you know, Jacob Young, a guy, a seventh-round pick, who maybe is proving to be a real find uh, for this team. So, yeah, I, I think it's not just the record. It's not even just what's happening in the games. But some of these individual developments, I think, really speak well to the rebuild and if this is the way this season is going to go uh this is a really good season they're not 14 and 15 because of the performance of the veteran stop gaps aside from trevor williams who else among those guys that you're saying boy they're really playing out of their mind or doing really well no they've gotten to this point because mostly of the job that their young building blocks have done so i think that is is the really encouraging part we've been talking for several years now about it's not so much the what it's the who and who is doing it? Well, right now, most of these young guys are contributing to it and making you think they can continue this. Uh, and so if you're going to get to about a 500 record, you'd much rather have young guys getting you there than the old guys. And so I think that, on top of everything else, continues to make this an encouraging start to the season. Uh, Victor Robles has started his minor league rehab assignment. How soon do you think he'll be back with the major league team? Well, he tripled, so that's a good sign for a guy with a hamstring injury. Um, I don't know. I think that's another interesting one. We're talking about outfield moves here. It would be easy to say you call him up and send Alex Call down. Um, you know, you can do that. I think there's a question of playing time with Jacob Young. Maybe Young ends up in right field some of the time with Victor in center field. Um, I, you know, I don't think they have to rush this. You give him at least a few days, make sure that he's comfortable and uh, hitting well and playing well the way that he was before he got hurt, but yeah, you don't want to wait too long. I, I, I know he may not fall into that same category, but we've talked about it when he's been healthy. The last two seasons, he's actually been very good. We just haven't been able to see him for any length of time because of injury. So I think once it's clear that he's back in form, you do bring him back up. Um, then maybe you hold off on that Eddie Rosario decision until you know what's going on with Lane Thomas or with Joey Gallo. Um, there are some fascinating roster moves that are coming up at some point. I don't think they're quite there yet. I, I think they can still make the more obvious moves at the moment, but there's going to come a point here when ideally they're healthy and you have some tough decisions to make.
This installment of the Nat Chat Podcast brought to us by Table to Mat, uh, which you can count on for all of your nutrition and personal training needs. At Table to Mat offers virtual and in-person nutrition services and personal training to the DMV area. You can email Table to Mat directly via table to mat.com or you can call 240-388-2206. That's the word table, the number two, M-A-T dot com. Um, Mark mentioned Trevor Williams next up for the Nats is game two at the Rangers Wednesday night at 8.05. And the man who has been the Nats best starting pitcher so far this season, Trevor Williams, will be the Nats starting pitcher. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show Nats chat podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube. Just search Nats chat or YouTube handle is at Nats chat podcast. We have a website that we invite you to check out as well. Nats chat podcast.com. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats chat are courtesy of 1067 the fan. So for Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We'll talk to you next time on the Nats chat podcast. And we're going to leave you with a special treat, a loyal Nats chat listener, Owen Ranger appropriate as an answer at the Rangers right now. Uh, Owen covers the double a Harrisburg senators for the Nats report. And uh, he is here to give us an update on uh, what's going on with the Nats at top prospects at double A.